Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel, and this is part of the good stuff, and I am super happy to have Meredith McGregor with us today. Hey, Meredith. Hi, it's great to be here. I am super glad to be here on this mid-August day of 2022, uh, and it's the rainy season in Phoenix. We just got a really good rain yesterday, about four or five hours of very steady rain, so the desert got wet, and we're expecting things to bloom. So, And where are you at, Meredith? Uh, I'm in Boulder, Colorado. A little bit cooler? It's a, it's a little cooler today. It has been a weird summer. It's been like solidly over 100 degrees oh, wow. all summer. And finally, it's in the 80s. And I am so thankful. <laughs> awesome. Very cool. Very cool. That is a uh, that is your home office. I just that's very colorful. It's lovely, <laughs> actually. Yeah. When we we moved to Colorado in January 2020 and got this house, and I was like, "Oh, there's a home office that will maybe be useful someday." Now uh -huh. it's the room I spend all of my time in, so it got a nice like colorful facelift to be a little bit more pleasant. It's lovely. It's lovely. Nice bookshelf too. Very cool. Yeah. So you're a you're a postdoc there at Boulder. Uh, I'm an assistant professor. Awesome! Congratulations yeah. on your new position. <laughs> or January 2020. New, newish. It it feels new, and it also doesn't feel new since I've been COVID pandemic professoring for three years. Yeah. Yeah. Are you are you teaching in person or are you doing online? Um, we're back in person this fall. Okay. Totally back in person. No masks. Anything. Mm. Mm. It'll be when an do, adventure. Mm. Uh, when do you start? When do you Next teach? week. Yeah. Okay. I start um, tomorrow. Oh, boy. I That's start early. tomorrow. So, yep. Are you teaching undergrads? or? Uh, I specialize in uh, large introductory courses. So okay. the one that starts up here tomorrow is uh, uh, Introduction to Solar Systems. Oh, that's cool. Kind of related to what we'll be talking about. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, so that's that's my teaching that starts here in the uh, okay. few days. So very excited about that. Yeah, that'll be fun. And we're going to have a little chaos in my house. I can tell right now we have a repairman coming in. So we'll just get through it. That's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be fun. That's right. about about right for the times. <laughs> there you go. Um, I'm Meredith. What do you like to do for research? Um, yeah, so I I say generally I'm an observational astronomer, um, and I try and understand how planetary systems form and evolve, and whether or not they might be habitable. Very so cool. that means I look at everything from circumstellar disks to flaring stars and planetary atmospheres. Very cool. Very cool. And that is going to bring us to this very awesome APJ letter. It's open access, people. Go ahead and grab a copy for free. All my images of the eccentric HD 53143 debris disk and Meredith, take us away. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so this is this is clearly focusing on the circumstellar disk side. And I will just start by sort of highlighting my list of co-authors here. Um, point out a few people. Chris Stark is sort of the person that kind of originally thought of this. He's worked with the Hubble data and, and really thought it would be fun to try and combine Hubble and Alma and do this multi-wavelength look. Um, and the other two people I'll call out are, are Spencer Hurt and Ward Howard, who are both early career scientists. Spencer is actually an undergrad who was working on this with me here at CU Boulder and Ward is wow. a host in my research group. Very um, nice. Yeah, uh, so I have, to, I have to call it the awesome early career people who make the research happen. Indeed. So, yeah, um, let's just walk through this. Um, HD53143 is a debris disk. And so what do we mean by a debris disk? Um, if we think about planet formation, um, planetary systems form in kind of these dust and gas rich disks that we call protoplanetary disks. Mm -hmm. Alma has taken tons of pictures of these. Uh, and then over time, the planets actually clear most of the material out of the disk. So you lose all the gas. And what you're left with is kind of remnant comets and asteroids basically like our Kuiper belt and asteroid belt um, that we call the debris disk. So they're really kind of the end stage of planet formation. Okay. Good. And the cool thing is that if there's planets that formed in those disks, um, they are gravitationally perturbing those remnant comets. And okay. so with ALMA, we can actually go and image the tr structure of these debris disks, right. model that structure, and then say interesting things about what planets might be in these disks that we're missing. Right. Um, so that's kind of the motivation to try and like go out and make high resolution images of these. Very nice. Uh, and so this disc was mm -hmm. first imaged with Hubble 
and it looked pretty um, unique. I actually, the image isn't actually in this paper, um, but you can go and look up Paul Callis's original paper showing the, the Hubble image of this disk. Um, and it was initially interpreted as being like a disk that's face on. So if you think of a disk like a donut, face on means you're looking like straight down the hole of the donut. Um, yep. And it had sort of asymmetries in it, which people, discussed being possibly resonant clumps. So like maybe there's a planet in the disk and it's mm -hmm. causing some material to be in these resonances. And so we're seeing this weird structure. Um, and that was really cool, right? Um, the catch is that Hubble is imaging tiny dust grains. So when we think about dust in disks, um, mm -hmm. essentially the wavelength of light you're looking at is the size of the dust grains you're sensitive to. Yep. So when you look in the scattered light, you're seeing tiny, tiny little micron sized dust grains. And lots of things can move tiny sized dust grains around, right? It's not just mm -hmm. planets perturbing them. <laughs> they can get blown out by stellar winds, radiation, maybe interact with the interstellar medium. Lots of things that are not actually planets sculpting material. Mm -hmm. So if we look with ALMA, we're now at millimeter wavelengths. So we're kind of probing like sand and yeah. grains that are that big are now big enough that they actually stay gravitationally bound to the belts where they're getting sculpted by planets. So they give us a better look at what the actual structure of the system is because we don't think they're getting perturbed by these other processes. Cool. Okay, so lots of motivation, right? Um, so we went and we took Alma, we were like, okay, we're gonna go see what this disc actually looks like. And we got back this lovely image in figure one. That is <laughs> and image. you look at this, it looks nothing like a face on disc with resonant clumps. Hmm. So it is completely not what we were expecting to see when we got Hubble. I remember when I downloaded this data for the first time and I like made the image and that's always a really exciting moment, right? You're like, I get to see the first image of this disc. And then I looked at it, I was like, wait a second. Um, that looks absolutely nothing like the models I put into our proposal. Um, <laughs> did I make a mistake? Did I make a mistake, All right, And you backtrack and all that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Usually you like put in a model and then you get back the data. It looks kind of like you thought it would. In mm -hmm. this case, it looks nothing <laughs> like we thought it would. Wow. So that was a fun adventure. Um, and then we had to get to trying to like interpret this and, and model it and figure out what's going on. Um, wow. So what actually this disc is, is it's inclined. So okay. now we take our donut, right? And we tip it. So okay. you're not actually looking straight down the hole. You're looking kind of at an angle through it. So that's mm -hmm. what we you know, call a disc that's inclined. Um, and if you look at the center there, there's this little like peak up in the center. It's kind of like zero, zero. That's the star. Mm -hmm. But it's not at the center of the disc, right? It's actually pretty like visibly offset. Off center, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so what that is, is the disc is actually eccentric. So instead of the star being at the center of the disc, it's actually at one of the foci because yeah. the disc is actually eccentric. Okay. Good. Yeah. Cool. Um, so Very that cool. is cool because it means it's really eccentric for us to actually be able to see that offset like visually. Yeah. It's the most eccentric disc we've ever actually observed. Oh, very cool. And okay. the other thing you might notice looking at this is that if you look in like the upper right side of the disc, that looks a lot brighter than the lower yes. left side of the disc, right? Asymmetry here. Yeah, so it's asymmetric. And what we think it is, is what's called apocenter glow. So that side of the disc, right, is farther from where we see the star. So it's the apocenter side. And the okay. opposite side is the pericenter side. Okay. And grains, dust grains, right, are moving on Keplerian orbits in this eccentric disk. And if you think back to Kepler's laws, right, things sweep out equal, equal areas in equal times. That means that at apocenter, grains are actually moving a lot slower right. because they don't need to move so fast to sweep ah. out that equal area. Ah. So you actually predict that you should have a surface density enhancement in eccentric disks because mm -hmm. all of those grains are spending much more time up there. And so with ALMA, we're seeing optically thin emission, right? We're seeing just, we're sensitive to the surface density of dust. Mm -hmm. So we see this brightening at apocenter just because there's more things there, which is just kind of straight from Kepler's laws, which I always find a really cool thing that's to think about. Nice. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Um, so that's the image, right? And if you go back up to the table above it, that kind of shows you how much ALMA data went into actually, you know, making this image. So we observed the system eight times with ALMA. These were taken in March of 2019. 
Mm -hmm. um, this was, you know, a moderately resolved configuration. It's not one of these like super ALMA configurations with 16 kilometer baselines, right? Our baseline yeah. is only 350 meters or so. Uh -huh. so. We actually went at this with fairly low resolution um, because we thought we were trying to resolve different structure than it turns out we were trying to resolve. So sometimes that happens. So um, when we work with ALMA data, um, we actually don't fit our models directly to this image. So if you, you know, black belt course in radio interferometry, your radio interferometer actually samples the Fourier transform of the sky image plane. Yes. So what we actually get out of these eight ALMA observations is the Fourier transform of our actual image. And then to make this image, we need to go through this process, which is called clean, uh -huh. in where you actually Kind of take the inverse Fourier transform and then try and account for the fact that your antennas are sparsely sampling the Fourier space. Mm -hmm. That's a nonlinear process. So when you go through that, you lose the ability to actually constrain the uncertainties on your model parameters. Whereas if you work in Fourier mm -hmm. space, you actually have the raw uncertainties that come directly from your measurements. I'm with you. Mm -hmm. So the approach that we take is to actually fit models directly to the millimeter visibilities. Okay. So we use an MCMC approach and then we basically create model images and then use a task called Galario to sample them onto the visibilities, the same as our observations, and then compute the chi-squared in that visibility space yes. and then kind of loop through this MCMC to do our modeling. So the results for the model are shown down in figure two. If we slide down to, I think the next page. Galarino, yeah, just looking yep. at that. MC, yep. Uh -huh. And MC. Mm -hmm. And there's some There's of the actual yeah. results, but maybe let's start by actually Picture. looking at the images because that will mean more. Yep. Yeah. Okay, we'll do a global. And if we want to zoom in on one, we can do that. Yeah, okay. So um, there's two rows here. And there are two different models that we fit. And in each row, the panels are the same. So the far left panel is just showing that data the same as figure one. Mm -hmm. The middle, middle left panel is showing the actual model at sort of the original pixel resolution okay. that we put it into the, to this modeling process. Okay. The next panel over is then image like the data. So we sort of export that model and run it through the same clean process and make a model image. Yep. And then the far right is what we call the residuals, which is if we took that image model, we subtract it from the data and we see mm -hmm. what's left, right? It's a visual way of seeing how well are we actually fitting this data. Very good, yes, me too. So the top row is, you know, let's imagine that we fit a normal symmetric disk model to this data, okay. right? Which you might say like, why do that, right? Because visually we've already established the star is not at the center of this disk, doesn't really look like a symmetric disk, but for complete list, let's just fit a symmetric model and see how far off we actually are. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so we fit this symmetric model, which is in that top lane. And then you can see the residuals on the right look pretty cruddy. Those are three mm. sigma residuals. So each contour is Yikes. three times the noise in the image. Yikes. Okay. So some of those you know, residuals are like 10 sigma. <laughs> we're not doing a very good job. Right. So you can see that some of those residuals are coming because we're not fitting the star well, right? Because in a symmetric model, yeah. the star is at the center. And mm -hmm. here, the star is not. Literally so not. That's producing some residuals. And then if you look in those like black dash lines, those are indicating where the main disk is. And in the upper right, we have some like six sigma residuals, which are coming from um, the fact that we're not fitting that epicenter glow. So that's really telling us that this is in fact an eccentric disk. So mm -hmm. then on the bottom row, we've moved to actually fitting an eccentric disk model. Okay. And to do this, essentially we kind of like Yes. throw down something, a large number of particles and basically calculate their orbital properties. So okay. we're trying to like calculate the Keplerian orbits of a bunch of particles. Okay. And mm -hmm. then enough that we've kind of fully sampled the space and okay. then we bin them into like a two-dimensional histogram to make an image. Okay. Okay. 
sample that image into the Fourier space, do the normal things like account for inclinations and position angles and additional offsets, and then run through the same process. Cool. Mm -hmm. So that now looks like a disk with a star that's offset from it, yeah. right? And we're getting that apocentric glow. You can see in that model image, it's brighter on the upper right side of the disk. Yes. So we're matching some things better. Um, but then if we look at the residuals, yeah, we've lost the the nine sigma contour, 10 sigma contour coming from the star. And we've lost some of the contours yeah. that are up in that apocentric glow thing. So we're definitely fitting the main outside belt and the star better. Mm -hmm. But then you probably might go, wait, there's still a six sigma contour there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a little bit. Right? Little bit. Yes. Yeah. I see so it. there's absolutely still like six sigma contours all in that inner part, right? So they're interior to that inner dashed line and that's the inner boundary of the outer disc. Okay. So there's clearly some dust emission that's coming from inside of what we think is the inner edge of the disc. Okay. Um, so you can see all of that if we scroll back up to table two, that kind of gives you the actual numbers that come out of this. Mm -hmm. like this. Mm -hmm. So then the left column is the symmetric model. So it's giving you all the parameters for that model that doesn't fit very well. And Got then it. the right column is the eccentric model. So it's giving you the actual best fits for everything. Mm -hmm. So the belt is at like 90 AU, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, our, our Kuiper belt is at sort of like 40 AU. So this right. is much further out. Yeah. Um, and it has a width of something like 20 AU. Um, we fit for a scale height, which is basically saying like, how flat is your disc? Does it have like a vertical thickness to it? And mm -hmm. it pretty much doesn't at all. It wants to fit to something very, very flat. Yes. Um, we get the geometry back, which is the inclination, the position angle, and the argument of pericenter, which is basically the rotation of that line of nodes in your eccentric disc model. Yes. Eccentric disc geometry is so fun. <laughs> Um, we get back a flux for the disk and the star, and then we fit these eccentricities. And I'll note that forced eccentricity is 0.2. Oh, That's mm -hmm. pretty extreme. That's the yeah. most eccentric we've seen a disk. Oh. The previous kind of record holder was Fomalhaut, which was something yeah. in eccentricity of like 0.1. Yes. This is twice that, so it's a very eccentric disk. That other eccentricity is what's called the proper eccentricity. So essentially, <laughs> In a disk like this, you have the forced eccentricity, which is like the global eccentricity. Okay. Let's say, imagine you have a planet and it's shaping this disk that's giving you your forced eccentricity. But then all of your particles have their own kind of orbits, right? And they can oh. scatter. So they can have an eccentricity that's slightly different from the global eccentricity. Okay. The mm. more you pump that up, you basically like thicken your disk. You actually increase the width because you're sort of like allowing all of your orbits to not be nicely epsidally aligned and nested. Now they're starting to scatter off of each other. Each other, you know, gravitation. Mm -hmm. And so that's what that proper eccentricity is trying to fit. Good. Okay. Thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. And it's actually quite high. Um, mm -hmm. So if we, you know, we can start walking through like the main conclusions from this. Um, cool. That proper eccentricity is pretty large. Yes. Um, so it, it means that things are not quite as upsidally aligned as we might think they are, um, which is kind of an interesting dynamical situation to think about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of walk through the discussion section a little bit, um, and I can highlight a few things. There's not pretty graphics for this because you can only put so many figures in an FJ letter. Um, uh, but the first section is really talking about that um, eccentricity. And mm -hmm. the fact that this is really eccentric compared to thermal hot, which is highlighted there as 0.12. Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost twice as eccentric. Mm -hmm. And and it has this high proper eccentricity. So kind of from the standpoint of just thinking about eccentric disks and how you shape them and how you maintain them for this kind of long time period, right. um, it's really an interesting case to think about because it's different than a lot of what we've seen, right? And so here we're trying to compare it to these various other eccentric disks. Mm -hmm. um, so things like Fomalhaut, there's another disk that's been imaged HD202628, which is highlighted kind of down there as well, which has an eccentricity of like 0.14. So similar to Fomalhaut, but nothing like this disk. Yeah. 
Um, and the middle part here is kind of trying to talk about how you might expect discs to be sculpted and shaped into being eccentric, depending upon their proper versus forced eccentricity. Okay. So if you have a low proper eccentricity, right? This is this picture of having orbits that are what we call epsidally aligned, where sort of all of your orbits come back to the same pericenter point and they're all kind of like nicely nested in each other. Mm -hmm. um, and if you start increasing that proper eccentricity, now you actually start changing the width of the disc and yep. you start moving away from this kind of nice epsidally aligned picture. Okay. Um, there's examples like in our own solar system where if you look at the rings of Uranus, they have like crazy differences between their pericenter and apocenter thickness because the, you know, it, it's thought that you have like self gravity and collisions and close packing happening in these rings, which are also a granular, you know, eccentric distribution of dust, not that dissimilar from a debris disk. Um, and so you can start having really weird dynamics that express themselves as having different proper versus forced eccentricities and different widths as a function around the azimuthal direction of the disk. Awesome. Very um, cool. So it is something that we could test in the future. If we had higher resolution observations, you could try and resolve any width differences that might happen around this disk. And if we could do that, it would be like a really interesting test for what the dynamics are of the system. Yes. Yes. Um, so if we keep going, um, then the next part here, right, is to come back to that weird excess that's yeah. in the middle of our model, right? Where uh -huh. we're clearly not modeling the inner part of that disk. Um, that's, you know, we can look back up at the figure. Uh -huh. right? Right so this is, this is showing the fact that we have these like significant six sigma contours here. And so yeah. obvious question is like, what the heck is going on, right? Why is there excess emission here? Um, yeah. mm -hmm. So one possibility which is really intriguing is that there might be a second ring in this system that we're just not really actually resolving. Ooh, okay. okay. So a possibility is that we have, you know, this nice outer of say Kuiper belt at 90 AU that we're actually resolving looks really beautiful. And then this excess emission is actually coming from something like, you know, an asteroid belt at say 25 AU that's interior. Interesting. So we just yeah. don't quite have the resolution or the sensitivity to be able to resolve that and detect it well. And so what we're seeing is actually sort of what we call the onsi. So if we come back to our like picture of a disc as a donut, right? Mm -hmm. if I look at a donut face on and I pick like any line of sight through it. I'm seeing the same amount of donut, right? It's like even yes. surface density. If I tip the donut, so it's like edge on say, and I look through the middle, I see like um, donut hole, see. more donut, right? But there's a hole. And if I look through one of the lines on the edge, it's like donut all the way down. So you actually, in discs that are really inclined, see what we call onsi, which is like uh -huh. left for uh -huh. jug handle, because you're seeing this like surface density from the fact that you're like not looking through the hole of the disc. Right, I'm waiting. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that like those... <laughs> kind of two mm -hmm. six sigma peaks on either side of the star are like the onsi of this inner disk that we're kind of not quite getting with our current observations, but we could try and resolve if we had more sensitive, higher resolution observations that would be like more finely tuned to looking at something at 25 AU. Okay. Um, because we only have this kind of modest configuration with Alma, we just do not have the resolution to actually like really resolve something that close to the star. That's a tantalizing possibility there. Yes. Yeah, it would be really cool because we've uh, never actually resolved well, like a inner disc like that uh -huh, in uh -huh. one of these systems. And so nice. now you get this really cool potential system where you've got this like outer disc that's eccentric. And then maybe we have an inner disc and there's a gap between them. And the inner disc, if we actually try and fit a model to that data suggests that it's actually more inclined than the outer disk. Ooh, okay. So you'd actually be having two disks yeah, that are yeah, yeah. aligned, <laughs> right? Like in our solar system, everything's in the same plane. Mm -hmm. And if this proves to be correct interpretation, then you have like a Kuiper belt and an asteroid belt that are actually kinked relative to each other. Nice. Um, nice. 
So also a really interesting dynamical situation to think about. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing that we try and talk through here is actually comparing back to those Hubble observations, which don't look anything like this. Um, so, you know, the original HST observations were coronagraphic imaging taken with STIS. Um, and uh, they are pretty good. They're not perfect, right? We could do better. And they definitely don't look like our OMLA observations. So um, in conjunction with this project, we've also obtained new Hubble observations with STIS. Um, and those are really interesting. And we didn't publish them in this paper because this was really focused on the ALMA data, but we have a new paper that should be coming out really soon, which Thanks. will show the new Hubble image of this as well for comparison. Very cool. The uh, spoiler alert is that it still doesn't look like the ALMA data. So okay. clearly okay. something is happening that's different okay. between ALMA and Hubble. Yeah. Right? And so we can kind of think back to this picture of grain sizes again, right? Mm -hmm. Alma is chasing these larger sand sized particles and Hubble is chasing these tiny micron sized grains. So we're seeing mm -hmm. a difference in what's happening to bigger grains versus smaller grains, right? Something mm -hmm. is happening in the system that's causing smaller grains to get kicked into different orbits than bigger grains. Um, and the place this is most notable is that we actually interpret the Hubble observations, the ones that already exist and the new ones seem to support having a higher scale height, right? So this is the thickness of the disk. Yeah. So the HST data suggests that the scale height should be something like 0.3, which is like a pretty puffy debris disk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas the ALMA data, like we already talked about, has the scale mm -hmm. height of like 0 0.04. So those are not the same number. Um, so mm -hmm. it implies that the sand, you know, the millimeter grains are kind of in this flat, flat disk and that something is kind of puffing these smaller grains up. Yeah. Um, one intriguing possibility that's been suggested in a bunch of models is that if you have a planet that's say orbiting inside of a debris disk, the planet can essentially stir mm -hmm. the smaller grains up out of the plane of the disk. And so you'd expect to see this scale height difference if you, you know, have this puffy small grains getting kicked up by the planet and the, the larger grains are sort of staying in the plane of the mm -hmm. disk. Mm -hmm. nice. So if you tie all those together, it starts to look like just a totally unique debris disk system, right? And there's a lot of lines of uh -huh. evidence pointing to the fact that there seems to probably be a planet or several planets in this system. Otherwise, how do you puff off small grains? How do you force it to be eccentric? How would you carve out a gap between two disks right. and have it in a system that's, you know, a gig a year old? So this isn't a young system, right? This is an oh. old, old disk. Okay. Um, so I think that's really intriguing and suggests that this is really a cool system to study more. Mm -hmm. The last part of this paper um, is actually touching on the star. Um, yeah. And mm -hmm. so this is a, you know, roughly sun-like star. It's a G9. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's younger than our sun, but it's comparable in many properties to the sun. Mm -hmm. um, as luck would have it, if you scroll down to the figure below, figure mm -hmm. three, mm -hmm. as completely uncoordinated, as we were looking at this with Alma, Tess happened to be observing this star as well. It is. Um, yes. So this was really fun to work on this paper because I, I really feel like doing these multi-wavelength observations lets you get a much mm -hmm. clearer picture of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And for this, you're able to work with ALMA and Hubble and TESS mm -hmm. and just get this really interesting multi-wavelength data set. So what this figure is showing is the ALMA flux and the TESS flux. Yep. Um, so the black points are our eight ALMA observations. So this is now in Julian date, but this is the same kind of sampling over the course of March. Yeah. And the gray in the background is the TESS flux mm -hmm. that's happening during that time. Wow. And the red line is what we would expect the flux at millimeter wavelengths to be if it was just a stellar photosphere doing nothing particularly interesting. Got it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the zero point. Yep. yep. That's the zero point, right? It's like 33 microjanskis. Mm -hmm. The ALMA flux is pretty much never actually that. So we're able to fit the stellar flux in each of the eight ALMA observations individually. And it is 
except for maybe one observation, a few observations, not what we would expect it to be if it was just a, a quiet photosphere. That's good. Yes. Um, so you can see that what's really notable is like right around, I don't know, 562 there, just before mm -hmm. it, there's this big jump. Yes. So those are two observations that were taken on the same night. So they're only about an hour apart. And, you know, it goes from being 50 microjanskis to being more than 100 microjanskis. So there's this huge change hmm. in flux. Huh. Um, we have done a lot of work in my group looking at millimeter observations of stars and trying to detect flares from stars um, at millimeter wavelengths. And we've seen a lot of this from MDORFs. Okay. So okay. Um, it seems like millimeter emission really is something that commonly happens in stellar flares and we just haven't really looked for it before. So one possibility here is that this is actually a flare where we've caught a flare um, mm -hmm. from the star with ALMA just kind of happening in the middle of our observations. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have the best time resolution because this isn't a very close star so we can't really like split down into finer and finer kind time cadence like we might want to if we really want to study flares right you want these like oh, couple yeah. minutes second cadence whereas here this is an hour um but it's enough of a change of brightness in a short enough time that it, it seems like it's probably some kind of flare mm -hmm. there isn't an obvious flare in the test data right so, so there's certainly some tension there um but from what we've been doing, studying like Proxima with these multi-wavelength campaigns, the optical and millimeter emission don't actually seem to correlate so well during flares. Okay. So it might just be that, you know, we're just not seeing that or there isn't an optical counterpart or we're just not detecting it with tests. Yes. Uh-huh. Um, you will notice that the test light curve looks pretty crazy in the background there. There's no flares but there's certainly a huge amount of spot modulation that's going on yes um yes. so that was surprising um and unexpected and uh as this star is so far south that it's actually kind of close to the continuous viewing zone for tests oh, okay. so while it was observing here, it was also observed in just tons and tons of test sectors. So there's a lot of test data for this star. Right. So we're actually able to then take all that test data and fit for a rotation period from it, which is like 9.6 days, which then mm -hmm. allows us to get a pretty precise age for the star. Awesome. So yes, yes, that's yes. really interesting because usually when we talk about disks, we kind of don't know their ages very well unless they're part of moving groups and then we can get a better handle on it. Um, and for disks, you really want to know the ages because you're trying to think about this in like a planetary evolution sequence. Yeah. Yeah. Without an age, you can't really do that, right? Um, so we're able to get a pretty precise cool. age on it that it's about a billion years old, which is a little younger than some of the previous estimates had made. Um, cool. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so you get this kind of like cool way of like getting a complete look at the system just by combining all of these different pieces together. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. nice. um, yeah, I, I like I like doing that. That that was that's a fun fun thing to do. Satisfying. <laughs> yeah, it's satisfying, <laughs> and it, it's it's also nice when you're just like, oh, cool! They just happen to be observing the star at the same time. <laughs> I will say the other interesting thing about this is because of that spot modulation is enormous. Um, uh, it actually means that the color of the star is changing over that rotation period. Wow. And this came up when we were trying to observe this with Hummel because you oh. need a reference star to do chronographic imaging. Oh, yeah. and Our reference star was failing. And the reason it was failing is actually because depending upon when you observed it, the color was changing so much from the spot modulation Yes, and we're like not actually having a spectral match with the reference star that you thought was a spectral match. That's wild. Um, okay. Yeah. So to do the Hubble observations, we actually had to like mm -hmm. use archival observations to try and pick out spectral matches based upon where it is in the rotation period. Uh -huh. um, so there's all sorts of interesting complications that that come when you actually get a more complete picture like that. Mm hmm. Sure. Um, so with that, that's pretty much the end of the paper. Um, so, you know, it was a really fun project to work on. And I think it's just a really unique and exciting disc. It looks nothing like we thought it would. And it doesn't really look like a lot of other debris discs. So it's certainly an interesting 
eccentric disc to to look at more um because i think we'll learn some really interesting things about how planets shape debris disks and kind of the dynamics of these systems which will be really illuminating when we talk about how planetary systems form and evolve over time indeed very awesome very cool meredith thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely apj letter and you kind of touched on it a couple times uh, so let me let me push on it there a little bit. Uh, on on where do we where do you think we go? Let's say over the next couple of years, are there additional uh, Almar observations either with a, uh, a larger baseline or a longer integration time for this particular system? Uh, are there other systems uh, that might be worth again either in uh, with Alma or multi wavelength or just sort of where do we head? Uh, let's say over the next couple of years to continue having this fun. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's there's a bunch of directions there. Um, mm -hmm. So obviously, if we really want to understand the system, we need better observations because right now we're sort of pushing like what the data will allow us to say about it. Mm -hmm. um, so the ALMA proposal results just came out um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, and we're actually going to get high resolution observations. Well, that's awesome. Very good. Yeah. Very good. So I'm when very excited because we'll be able to conclusively say once and for all whether there is an inner disk or not. And we'll be able to look for these kind of like changes in the width of the disk as a function of azimuth to like look for dynamical properties and cool. and really kind of say a lot more about this. So I'm super excited about that. So are those observations going to take place this year, 2023, or do you have a slot? Yeah, so the next ALMA cycle starts in October and then yeah. runs for a year. So mm -hmm. they'll happen sometime between October 2022 and October 2023. Okay, good. Congratulations. Coming soon. Um, and then I think on a like broader point, you know, mm. it's really fun and interesting to look at these one-off systems. And a lot of all of our observations have been this, right? It's sort of like stamp collecting. You take something that looked odd, maybe in Hubble or something else, and you're like, okay, I want to look at this in nice high resolution and get a beautiful image and understand this system. Um, and that's really useful and valid and fun to do. But if we want to understand planet formation on a more global scale, we need to move beyond that kind of stamp collecting and actually look at a larger sample of disks. And mm -hmm. we haven't been able to do that with debris disks so far. Debris disks are hard. They don't have a lot of material like protoplanetary disks, right? They've lost most of their mass, so they're faint. And so you have to observe for really long times to get these beautiful images. Um, but Another project that I'm on uh, as a co-I is an ALMA large program that just got accepted Ooh. this time around um, called ARCS, which is going to do, you know, basically the D-sharp survey, but for debris disks. So we actually look at a big sample of disks and we get yeah. these beautiful high resolution images and I start see. thinking about the structure of debris disks, not as one-offs, but as like a big global sample. So that will be really cool. All right. Oh, well, this is great. Um, I'm really looking forward to... Uh... Some of the more detailed observations on this particular system, and then in general, as we sort of figure out how do these one-offs, these stamp collectors, fit inside the big global picture. So, yeah, uh, sounds like there's going to be a lot of very interesting activity over the next couple of years on this. So, very yeah. cool, very cool, nice. And that will do. So, Meredith, thank you once again for walking us through your very lovely APJ letter. And that will do everyone. And I hope this makes your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Thanks. <laughs>